Hi, this is Elliot Fishman. Welcome to part two of our talk on cystic pancreatic lesions. When we stopped at the end of part one, we were discussing about the importance of looking for small lesions with IPMNs. We talked about main duct IPMNs. We spoke about side branch IPMNs. We talked about mixed type IPMNs. Here's a good example of a side branch IPMN, a little bit under a centimeter. This case also makes the point how much easier it is at times to see small cystic lesions when you look at the coronal display. Sometimes you can use some software which does a center line tracking through the pancreatic gland, laying or filleting the gland open, and that can be very helpful as well. But you can see the small IPMN. When I see this, I say it's a centimeter. I don't see a dilated pancreatic duct. If you look really hard, you can see a communication with the pancreatic duct, though I would agree that MR can do this a little bit better. Now, the other thing about this lesion, there's no enhancing wall, there's no wall thickening, there's no nodularity. This is a lesion, I guess, you know, depending on the patient's age and history, you might follow, but in your heart, you know, this is a low priority lesion. Here's another example. You can see the pancreatic duct. You also can see the lesion comes off the pancreatic duct. Again, it's about a centimeter in size. Again, it's a lesion classic for IPMN. Nicely shown here. And again, this is to make the point that there's the lesion, but look how much easier it is to see when you look at the coronal view rather than just the axial view. We talk about the size of smaller lesions, again seen here. And again, we describe them. Now, the question is, and this is a hard thing, the ACR has written about it, uh, there's lots of work being done that we are spending too much money and too much time and too much effort and scaring too many people when you say you need a follow-up, and I'll discuss this in a bit, for the next nine years. One of the things to remember is when you have an IPMN, it's really signifying a field defect, which increases the chance of pancreatic cancer. It doesn't mean you're going to get the pancreatic cancer where the cystic lesion is. It could be anywhere in the gland. So it's not as simple. And again, who do we follow and who do we not follow? Now, we also can see multiple IPMNs. They can be of varying sizes. Here's a case where there's a lesion in the patient's uncinate process, in the body of the pancreas, another lesion in the body, a lesion toward the tail of the pancreas. So it's not uncommon to see multiple lesions, and you have to look at each of them. Now, the question you could ask is, if you have multiple lesions, does that multiply the chance of getting cancer? If you have four IPMNs, is it four times the risk of one? And the answer is no, it tends to be the same risk, but you have to carefully follow each of the lesions, and one lesion may be more suspicious than the other. Now, here's an example of a cystic lesion in the pancreatic head. The problem with this lesion, it's over three centimeters. When you look hard, there's slight wall thickening, there's septations, there's slight irregularity of the lesion. And when you see a lesion like that, and you look at it here in the coronal, a volume rendered view, when you start th seeing a thickened wall or septations, and particularly with that size, you need to evaluate further. This is not somebody I would say come back in six months or 12 months. This is somebody I would send for EUS and they'll sample the fluid. Now, there's a lot of work going on with EUS and fluid sampling, a lot of work from different places, Hopkins, University of Pittsburgh are two good examples, where you could look at the fluid and potentially predict who is at risk or who is not at risk for developing cancer. You also can pick up different mutations suggesting whether it's a serous cystadenoma. So I think what we're gonna see a lot of in the future, and the future means now or near term, is you'll sample the fluid and you'll be able to say, this person does not need to be followed. This person needs the lesion resected now because it's a high grade or highly suspicious for developing into malignancy. And this person should be followed more uh, carefully, but do it every six to 12 months. And again, in this case, with this cystic lesion with thickened wall and septations, it ends up this was a high grade dysplasia and the patient had a Whipple's procedure. Now, another example, here's a patient with a cystic lesion in the pancreatic head and some septations and a dilated pancreatic duct, and that ended up being a low-grade dysplasia. 
On the other hand, this case was an intermediate grade dysplasia. Now the lesion is larger, it was 4.1 centimeters. There were several additional lesions, mild dilatation of the pancreatic duct. And are you worried about this lesion? I don't know, you know, it's cystic, there's no wall thickening. The biggest worry is the patient's lesion size. And here it is when I do some volume rendering, the size is over 4 cm, but there's no nodularity, there's no wall thickening, there's no septations. It's really hard to figure out what to do with these lesions. On the other hand, this one's a high-grade dysplasia, but you probably would have been worried because the lesion is cystic, but there are multiple septations. There are multiple cystic lesions. There's some thickening in the wall present. This is one that would make me very, very concerned. Here it is on the coronal view. You can see some glandular calcification, maybe prior pancreatitis. The distal gland is atrophic. The duct is dilated. You would wonder, is this whole thing the main pancreatic duct? Or is this a combination of main pancreatic duct and cystic lesions? At times, it can be challenging. But with this appearance, I'm worried about dilated main pancreatic duct. I'm worried that we're dealing with a mixed type IPMN. And based on appearance, I'm worrying about high-grade dysplasia or malignancy. And this patient will get sampled uh, by EUS and then will go to surgery. So again, I think one of the things and takeaway messages is that we can at times suggest low-grade dysplasia, intermediate uh, or high-grade, we probably could say a little bit more certain, but it's not that easy. This lesion in the tail here is a high-grade dysplasia. It's cystic, but when you start looking at it, you see the relationship to the pancreatic duct. But why isn't this a low-grade dysplasia? Well, when you look more carefully, you can see there's some textual changes right here in portions of the gland. The duct is dilated. There's some atrophy here. This appearance alone with the cystic component here and here makes me highly concerned that this patient has either a high-grade dysplasia or early malignancy. And again, as you start looking at it in coronal view, there's a cystic lesion, but look how irregular the pancreatic duct is. To me, this is malignant till proven otherwise. No matter how many ways you look at it, but again, it's important to realize the concern increases as you go from the axial to the coronal to the volume rendering, but it was high-grade dysplasia, okay? In this case, high-grade dysplasia. Again, septations, size, nodularity, it's cystic, yes, it's an IPMN. You could have maybe thought about a serous cystadenoma, which we'll cover soon, but it doesn't have the look of a serous cystadenoma. This lesion would at a minimum be sampled, but you would really have to worry. You look at just this one component, the septations, the thickening, the nodularity, and multiple components all are gonna make you concerned. So patient management. Again, when you think it's a small lesion or there's no criteria perhaps of septations or nodularity, follow-up management at six to 12 months. But again, how often do you follow? And I'll come to that in a moment. Any suspicion at all, any family history at all, go to EUS to make sure there's no underlying uh, abnormality to suggest high-grade dysplasia. And then of course, if you see features, then you would need to go to surgery. Now, there was an article by Alec Megabo. This is going back about six years now, a white paper on incidental findings, but looking at the incidental pancreatic cystic lesion. Now, this was a redo of a prior paper, and I think the challenge everyone has, and there's been numerous societies in the GI side, in radiology, in surgery, in gastroenterology that have come up with different criteria. And when every organization has a different set of criteria, you know there's a problem. So what Alex did in, and the group with him, they divided things up into categories and they made it under 1.5 cm, 1.5 cm to 2.5 with main duct communication, 1.5 to 2.5 cystic lesion without communication or can't be determined, over 2.5, and then assist but the patients over 80 years of age. So what they recommended was 
following patients for 9 to 10 years, terminating at age 80, and for patients who are under 65 at the time of initial cyst detection, a follow-up terminating at age 80 will exceed the 9 to 10 year length, but may be prudent. Such decisions regarding initial follow-up should be determined at the individual patient level. So what Alec was saying here basically is they're coming up with a 10 year follow-up, but that really is a meaningless 10 years because there is no such thing as decreasing risk or lack of risk at 10 years. If you follow a 40 year old to age 50, that's 10 years, but there's no decrease in the chance of malignancy. In fact, the chance of the patient's cystic lesion becoming malignant increases with time. So this nine to 10 year is a good thing to do for the next to ten, nine to 10 years, but it's not really gonna be a solution. So here are some charts, and again, I'll just show you the charts. Incidental pancreatic cyst patients under 80, it's under 2.5 or over 2.5, and then you can see you follow it down, re-imaging, Q2 years times two, look for growth, look if it's stable, if it doesn't change size, continue to follow it, if it grows, do EUS. So you can see that also a lesion at first may be 2.3, so it's in the under 2.5 category, but even if it grows two millimeters a year, which does not make it malignant, it will change categories. And again, of course, we talk about the smaller lesions under 1.5, how do we treat those patients? You could look at the charts. And then the 1.5 to 2.5 without ductal communication or can't be determined. Here's how we would track those. And here's the same 1.5 to 2.5 cm incidental lesions with main duct communication. So you can see it's very complicated how often you follow, how frequently you follow, and the only thing that stays the same is what are you looking for. But again, we talk about all sorts of things. Here's over 2.5. Is it high risk? Do you need EUS? Do you need uh, low risk? Then you get imaging, or is it a serous cyst adenoma? It's not everything that's cystic over 2.5 is an IPMN. It's probably more likely, in fact, at times, not to be an IPMN. And the summary statement, the natural history of incidental pancreatic cysts remains uncertain, and our recommendations cannot be simple or definitive. Since 2010, several multi-institutional and specialty society consensus papers, meta-analysis, and large-scale observational studies have appeared, but the quality of evidence has been characterized as poor or inconclusive, and conclusions remain controversial. And so when you look at it, I think Dr. Megabo was trying to do the best he can because you need to have advice for people. But I think if you look carefully and you look between the lines and you look at all the other society recommendations, no one knows the correct answer. And lots of articles recently have suggested we're over-diagnosing or over-treating these patients. But again, that's not the simplest thing to say. But here are some common principles. All incidental cysts should be presumed mucinous unless the cyst has features of an alternative diagnosis like a serous cyst adenoma or has been proven by aspiration not to be mucinous. Such presumed mucinous cysts should be followed or considered for surgery. We generally recommend nine to 10 year follow-up with varying schedules based on initial size. If a cyst grows, the frequency of follow-up should increase and or EUS with fine needle aspiration should be considered. Number two, cyst size directs follow-up or intervention. And although they made up arbitrary levels under 1.5, over 2.5, in between 1.5 and 2.5, um, Again, talking about the three sonometer criteria for resection, but again, people are not following that criteria any longer because the flow charts apply to assist a range of sizes. A person's cyst may grow, and so they may change the category. Cysts don't get smaller, but they can grow. And so you might be in the under 1.5, and then you go to the 1.5 to 2.5 category, or well, you're in that category and you go to over 2.5. So again, it becomes not as simple and you need to have accurate measurements. The question always comes down, is it measurement on the axial view or the coronal view? Obviously axial views are only one view, the coronal view, and perhaps more accurate is the volume view, which nobody in fact is doing. 
Development of worrisome features or high-risk stigmata, as described, including nodularity, thick septations, wall enhancement. Again, then EUS and surgery is the next step. The, ex the exception is that cysts over 3CM without any additional worrisome features or high-risk stigmata can be alternatively followed. So again, um, what do you see within the lesion becomes very critical. And of course, prior studies are very critical, looking for developing septations, nodularity. Remember, two millimeters or less growth is okay. It does not give you a uh, more worry about malignancy, but over two millimeters a year does. And so you need to be very careful when you measure and how you measure. All of those things become very important. Now, when you listen to everything I've told you, it makes things seem very complicated, and indeed it is. And so it's hard for any one radiologist in a group to provide all of the answers. And so multidisciplinary clinics, we, we've had that for years for pancreatic cancer, and now we have that for pancreatic cystic lesions as well. The uh, multidisciplinary conference altered the management of a third of the patients who was sent to the clinic in the majority of cases. Surveillance was recommended with surgery recommended in just under 10% of all patients, although no further follow-up was required in just under 2% of patients who had benign disease. None of the patients in whom the recommendation was changed from surgery to surveillance developed evidence of malignancy during the follow-up. So again, that becomes very good. In this article by Fuente, long-term outcomes with cancer and IPMNs, uh, the study found that the pancreatic cancer risk was low in patients with Fukaka negative IPMNs and similar to that of patients without IPMNs, and that while IPM-associated pancreatic cancer accounted for a small proportion of all pancreatic cancer cases, these patients had better survival. So I think one of the things this article brings up is that we are probably following a lot of patients and doing a lot of aggressive things when probably it's not really necessary. But again, till we have better information, it's gonna be hard to do that. Um, in this article, CRIPA, IPMNs of the pancreas more epidemiological than clinically relevant. Uh, once considered a rare disease, IPMNs are now very common due to tremendous technology advantages and advances that have improved diagnostics. Obviously, it is not possible to generalize given that some IPMNs have the potential to progress the cancer over time. Although results of the study should be validated in larger cohorts, they represent useful clinical data from an unselected population-based cohort that helps challenge current IPMN surveillance policies that recommend lifetime active surveillance for all fit individuals. So, Crippo was making the point that we are following too many patients and that in the future, a multi-omics approach, it may be fluid, it may be blood, it may be imaging, it's surely going to be AI to further start selecting subgroups of patients who will be treated differently, that it can't be a one-size-fit-all. Obviously, if you have comorbidities, it, and you can't get pancreatic surgery, it does seem like aggressive follow-up probably isn't necessary. But again, I think we're learning and we really need to rethink the process. So that's pseudocysts and IPMNs. IPMNs is the most challenging. I think what's very important and really what we can do a lot in terms of imaging is the ability to distinguish an IPMN from a serous adenoma or an MCN, or a neuroendocrine tumor, or a SPEN. Now, you can't always do this, but many times I think you can. You just have to learn the appearances of the other lesions. One of the most challenging other lesions is serous cyst adenoma because it can very much look, particularly when it's small, like an IPMN. Serous cyst adenomas also can be large, and you don't want to call something an IPMN and ask for surgery because it's six centimeters when it's a serous cyst adenoma. So what we're going to do is we're going to stop here and let's come back and take a good look at serous cyst adenomas. See you in a few minutes. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. 
We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.